Um, open with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 6 is where we left off. And I am encouraged, actually. Worship this morning was, was sweet. You know, our numbers are small. As, as Brett mentioned, um, a ton of our ladies are away this weekend. So encouraged that you all came uh, this morning to join us. So Paul told us, if you remember last week in chapter 5, that we are ambassadors for Christ. And he begins chapter 6 by telling us that we're workers together with Christ and that today is the day of salvation. And it's time for us to get to work. Uh, we made it that far last week um, through verse 2 of chapter 6. And he continues on with that thought in our chapter and then actually has to continue on with his uh, defense of his apostolic ministry and gives what we might think of as sort of a resume to this church. Um, but before we get to all of that, I want to say like personally, oh, here's an announcement I forgot. Growth groups. Growth groups are starting up this week again. And there's sign-up sheets on the back. Strongly, strongly, strongly encourage you, appeal with you that you join a growth group, both for your good and for the, the ministry that you can have to others in those groups. Some of them are full, and, um, but there is spots um, still back there. So I encourage you guys to do that. And I actually missed, really, really missed being in growth group this past week because I, I love the process I love the process of after the, the message has been given and, and the word is spoken of sometime later in the week, sitting down and meditating on it and, and considering again what the Lord said and how that applies in my life. And then answering the questions, sitting down and answering the questions. Some of you guys don't like that part, but even, even writing the questions, answering the questions challenges me and then sitting in group and being challenged and strengthened by the others in my group this this idea that we talked about last week of being ambassadors workers together with christ and servants of christ really consumed so much of my thoughts over this past week um, so much so that i actually changed the title of our message this morning uh, from what you have in your bulletins. I, I can't remember actually what it is in your bulletins. The word of truth. And, and that's from a verse in our chapter. But I actually changed it to actions speak louder. And you guys have maybe heard an expression like that when you were a kid. Especially if you had good parents. You guys probably remember it, don't you? Actions speak louder than words. Right. What, is, what does that mean? Wrong. It does not mean silence. Okay? I, I know there's some ladies here this morning, but I want to say some things. Okay? I had considered... I had considered... Um, where such a huge number of our ladies are away and being strengthened and encouraged, hammering away on the men this morning. It's probably why half of them were like, oh, I couldn't get the kids together. I couldn't make it. Um, they suspected that. Uh, because you can do that differently when it's men or the majority of men than when it's a mixed crowd and, and you guys think, oh, you're calling me out in front of my wife or whatever. Um, so I considered that, but the Lord said no. Um, and then I had actually considered, somebody actually asked me this morning, I won't say who it was because it was shameful, but... I actually considered doing a really short message this morning as well, um, thinking some of you men have parented all weekend long. And, you know, if I could keep you out here and keep your kids back there for a couple of hours, it, it might be a nice break. Um, but then I realized we've got men back there taking care of them and I just probably don't want to push that any further than necessary. So let's pray and we'll see what the Lord has for us this morning. Father, again, we're grateful for our gathering. And, and Lord, I'm grateful for this passage of Scripture. And 
Oh, Lord, I, I pray that it challenges every single one of us here and changes every single one of us here or watching online this morning, that your word would accomplish your will in each of our lives, individually and collectively. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So I know you guys think you got out of it, um, but I, I want to know, what does this mean? When you hear that statement, and it's, it's one that we're familiar with, actions speak louder than words, uh, one we know, one we've heard most of our lives, but what does that actually mean? Do it, don't just say it. Do it, don't just say it. I like that. I like that. Anybody else got a, a spin on that or explanation on that? Yeah, people remember what they do, not what they hear from you. Good. Um, so putting those together, um, what you say doesn't matter if it's not what you do, right? Or, or because what you do, because what you do says more than what you say. Probably easier to just say actions speak louder than words, right? Um, but I've been challenged this week by what does what we do say? And, and I'm not going to talk in riddles all day. Um, but these have just been my thoughts this week as, as I've gone back over that passage. And verse 2 from, from this chapter that we covered last week, especially the end of verse 2, where it says, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And I encourage those that were here with us last week and those that were watching online to make that truth in their lives. If they hadn't received Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, meaning that you acknowledge that the Word of God is true and that Jesus is the only way to heaven. Remember we read that verse at the end of chapter 5, uh, the very last verse of chapter 5, I said that was the doctrine that, that made that possible. Verse 21 says, For he made him who knew no sin, Jesus, he made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That Jesus came and he lived a sinless life and was put to death, the, the death on the cross, uh, to pay the price or to pay the penalty for your sin and mine, that, that we uh, might or could become the righteousness of God, that through that we could be made right with God. And I read the first two chapters, or first two verses of this chapter, because it, it all ties in to what we talked about last week. Again, verse 1, he says, we then as workers together with him also plead with you, that was the heart of Paul. We plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Meaning, and, and I won't re-preach the whole sermon, uh, but in short, if we insist, if we continue to insist that we want God to judge us based upon what we have or what we haven't done, rather than based on what Jesus did for us, then we've received the grace of God in vain. Because Jesus then died in vain for us if we don't receive that. And, and I can't tell you, and reflecting back over that this week, how many stories I just happened to come across um, from pastors and Christians that had shared the gospel with a person or, or a group of people, and they decided that they weren't quite ready and they, they wanted to wait. Hearing the good news, they, they weren't ready to decide. And then before that opportunity came, a tragedy occurred. And that second or third or tenth chance never came. And rather than share those stories or, or any stories, I'll remind you, and it was actually mentioned in prayer meeting this morning, to not decide is to decide. You are making a choice. And the Bible tells us that those opportunities to choose are limited. 
and I'll take it further. I know where most of you guys stand. I don't know where everyone online or what might someday. Um, those that may hear this after the rapture or, or someday in the future. Hell is full of those that weren't ready to decide. Those that wanted to wait until they were ready. And it was too late. Paul says today is the day. And we pick up our study this morning in verse 3. After those things with this idea of actions speak louder than words. And Paul says in, in verse 3 where we pick up this morning of chapter 6. We give no offense knowing that if we do it negates Every other thing that we do. Let's look at it together. He says, we give no offense in anything that our ministry might not be blamed. Okay, Paul knows that we can give offense in the things that we say. We can give offense in the things that we do. Uh, text, post, tweet, snap, tick, talk, whatever. I don't know. Eat, drink. Uh, remember um, the whole pagan taco truck thing from 1 Corinthians that Paul, well, Paul didn't share. We shared as we were going through it. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 9 says, But beware, lest somehow this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to those who are weak. So it's not just bad things that we do that can be offensive, but gray areas or things that might technically be okay aren't okay if they bring offense in a way that could tarnish your ministry. And, and then he goes on in verse 4, and I think just emphasizes this point that he's making. He says, but in all things, we commend ourselves as ministers of God. And I, I know I'm not getting very far. I didn't finish that verse. But I want you to see, I, I want you not to miss that he says, in all things. In all things, we commend ourselves. Not some things, not even most things. Or in all things except this, this one area. Paul says, in all things, we commend or we validate, we show ourselves to be authentic, the, the real deal as ministers of God. And thinking about that, if, if we were to say the same thing about ourselves, and I realize we're not apostles here, right? We're just plain old ordinary Christians. But if we were to say we commend ourselves as ministers of God or as servants of God, how much evidence from our lives could be produced to show that's just not true? What offenses in our lives are there that might contradict that statement? Now, I, I said I'd get back to this verse, but I want you to see that Paul gives us a list here of examples. I think there's nine or ten of them. And they're all preceded with the word in, I-N, okay? So, in much patience, he says. And I, I don't want to bust out the Greek here. Actually, I would like to bust out the Greek. I just don't know Greek, so I can't. But if you look this up in a Greek lexicon or in a Greek dictionary, it's different um, than how you might think of patience if we're just um, trying to define it in today's terms. Sorry, Brett, this is bugging me, man. Um, patience. Some of you, if, if I go two or three minutes over today and you sit in your chair, you don't storm up and walk out. That's patience, you know, or you, if you can go out on a boat and cast a line and sit there and, and wait for a fish to nibble. That's patience to some of you guys or uh, uh, waiting for the next group to get off the green so you can hit your approach shot or some of you guys have got teenage daughters waiting for the bathroom might be patience for you. But this is something deeper that Paul's talking about here when he says patience. It's a steadfastness, a uh, constancy, faithful endurance to the end. 
is what he's talking about. And he goes on and he says, in tribulations, meaning being under intense trials, stress, pressure. So what I want you to get as we're going through this list, Paul is saying as ministers of God or as, as a servant of God, these are the times when I had to remember that I was a minister of God. You know, these are the times that tested me. These are the times that I had to remember the call that the Lord had placed on my life. And he goes on and he says, in needs, in distresses, that word literally means pain, anguish, the type that's uh, pressing and closing in. I was going to use the example of, oh, that ship, um, Ever Given, right? That was stuck in the Suez Canal. Remember that? Couldn't get through blocked everything up. But I thought a better picture for this group could maybe be painted if I used an image of what they call the fat man's misery. I don't know if you can really visualize what that is. It's, uh, it's, it's on the loop trail section of Tumbledown Mountain in Maine. I think every state with a mountain has a fat man's misery somewhere, but this is ours in Maine. And it's on that trail. And, and what you can't really see from this is you, you have to climb up into this it looks you get to the mountain and there's just a crevice there that you crawl through and then you go up on these rungs and you see that little tiny hole um, the idea is that it's pressing in on all sides with nowhere to turn there's actually some really cool youtube videos of people trying to get through there but that's kind of the picture of what paul is talking about here in this verse and um, he goes on and he says in stripes and by stripes, he means lashings. You guys remember the, the 40 minus one that Paul endured multiple times. In imprisonments, you guys know what that is. In tolmets, that's a word we don't use all the time. But think of a hot, angry, violent mob, like a, like a riot. Paul endured that many times and had to remember who he was in Jesus. And it says in labors, and, and some of these were things that were actually chosen or self-imposed by Paul so that he could faithfully endure. Right? Nobody made Paul work as hard as he worked. Um, and, and that contributed to sleeplessness, uh, along with having to be alert even at night because of the dangers that he faced. And he says in fastings, and here, again, in context of, of how he writes it, these weren't just fastings or denying the flesh for the sake of prayer and presence with the Lord. It was also due to a scarcity of food that they experienced sometimes in their ministry. So, church, what I want you to know, and maybe it's more important um, for, for our men here than our ladies. I don't know if that's true, but I want you to know that people are watching us watching you all the time. And they're not just watching us when things are good or when we have an opportunity to share our faith and the circumstances all align and it's the perfect opportunity or to share the gospel like I'm doing today. It's not just then, but they're watching your lives and seeing how you react when things go wrong. When there's a, a loss in your family, when there's a diagnosis that you didn't expect or even even when we have to pay to fix our daughter's exhaust on our car in Maine last weekend and then pay again six times as much down in Massachusetts just a few days later people watch how you respond to things like that you know are you constantly complaining are you are you broken by things like that so if these are the examples that Paul gives, uh, when he had to remember that he was a minister of the gospel, what is the personal application for us? Again, I said, well, we're not apostles. We're just Christians. So how does this apply? If we claim the name of Christ, if we profess to be Christians, then we need to act like it. Our walk it better match our talk. In verse 6, he, he starts with another list of, of nine by statements 
They all start with by. And, and some say, you go through the commentaries, and some say that these are the, the mental and then the spiritual things that Paul endure, endured. And I don't really think that's it, though. As I go through this list, I think it's more the, this is how. Um, these are the things that, that we had in our tool bags. These are the things that we used. Look at verse 6 with me. He says, by purity, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, kindness even when others were not kind to them or refused to receive it, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere love, he says, by the word of truth, by the power of God, the power of God. Paul, Paul tells us what that is. If you remember in 1 Corinthians uh, 118, it says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And he ends that verse, verse 7, with saying, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. And you can think of that as the, the armor of God is having both offensive and defensive weapons. Right? In verse 8, he continues with a, a series of contrasts. He compares different things. And, and I think it's, it's made up of what others judged him as and who he really was in Christ Jesus. So uh, verse 8 says, By honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown, uh, as unknown and yet well-known. Help me out there, brother. Um, as dying, and behold, we live as chastened and not yet killed. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. As poor, yet making many rich. As having nothing, yet possessing all things. So, you guys with me so far? Let me just summarize, okay? Let me summarize what we have so far in this chapter. I know your wives aren't here helping when you're keeping you awake, but um, Paul says, look, church, he's writing this letter, and he's saying, we've had all kinds of troubles. We faced all kinds of things, but we have been faithful, and we've patiently endured all of these things by focusing on our walk with Jesus and our witness for Jesus. Specifically, the things that we say and the things that we do, and we've, we've responded to all of these things with pure kindness. Asking ourselves, what, what would Jesus do here? Or, or what would Jesus have us do here? How should we respond to this? What's going to honor him? So no, no matter what we face, we remember that Paul's defense that he used of his ministry was... That Paul was able to say, say whatever you want about me. Make any accusation that you want about me, but I'm living it every day. You can see it in my life. But in all of these things, we commend ourselves. He could say that in all things. Again, application for us in, in this post-Christian nation that we live in, as ambassadors and co-laborers, and servants of the Lord, we have to remember that our Bibles, I'm sorry, our lives may be the only Bible some people ever read. I think I first heard that when I was in like seventh grade and it kind of blew my mind. Meaning that what they see of Jesus in us may make them thirsty for more, right? We're called to be salt in the world. What they see of Jesus in us can cause them to realize the darkness in their own lives. We're, we're called to be light in this world and illuminate darkness, shine a light on it. But again, what they see in us, if we're exercising our liberty or, or we're being rotten or unforgiving or prideful, they can look at your life and conclude they don't have anything that I need. And then they take the grace of God in vain and die apart from Jesus. 
Does that make sense? Actions speak louder than words. So we, like Paul, should seek a life of purity. I know that's not popular today. That's what the word of God calls us to. And I'll go further and say that if you're truly saved, then God will give you a desire to live a life that pleases him and to grow. And there will be evidence that you're becoming more and more like Jesus. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments in the gospel of John. And on to verse 11, Paul states, O oh, Corinthians, and you can just kind of sense his um, urgency and, and uh, passion as he speaks to them. O oh, Corinthians, we have spoken openly to you. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted by your own affections. Now in return for the same, I speak to you as children. You also be open. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, he says in verse 14. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness and what communion has light with darkness. Now, specifically in the context of this letter, Paul's actually talking about false teachers here. Okay, but the principle of this is found throughout the scriptures. Back in the, in the book of Deuteronomy, way back in the Old Testament, it tells us they're not to yoke unlike things together. Um, like a big oxen with a little donkey. Uh, they're just not the same. And if you can picture a yoke that would tie two animals together and, and one is a, a giant ox and one is a little donkey, what's going to happen when they try to pull that load? One, one's going to be ahead of the other, right? They're always going to be off course. And that's exactly what it does to us. Christians should not be yoked together dating or, or planning to marry a non-Christian. And if you are, uh, my best advice is to break it off. Because very, 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 very rarely does it ever work out like you're hoping it will. I'm not saying it doesn't on occasion, but I'll tell you, I spend a lot more time counseling people that went against what the word of God says, then got the fairy tale magic ending. Christians are not wise to partner in business relationships with non-Christians. Uh, you, you got completely different goals or you should. And in those circumstances, you're playing with fire premaritally. Even Christians, two Christians dating. I think there can be an um, unequal yoking. If, if one Christian is on fire for the Lord and involved in church and, and wants to have kids and raise them up and train them in the Lord and, and do all those things, and then you, you've got the one that's on fire and you've got another one that smells like they're on fire because their pants are smoking. They're so close to the, the fires of hell, right? You do what you want to do and I'll go to church on... Christmas and Easter, that's, that's not an equal yoking. Amos 3.3 3 says, can two walk together unless they are agreed? There's actually a, a biblical example, a few biblical examples of the perils of yoking with an unbeliever in business. Some of you guys might remember, if you've done the, the chronological reading with us, you should remember the story of King Jehoshaphat. And it's basically in Second Chronicles chapter 20, his story's longer than that. Um, going back to chapter 17, gives us a little bit of his history, tells us about this guy. It says, now the Lord was with Jehoshaphat. I love that name. Don't you? I, I got a grandbaby coming. I'm kind of hoping Jehoshaphat. It's unique. Um, now the Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he walked in the former ways of his father David. He did not seek the Baals, but sought the God of his father and walked in his commandments and not according to the acts of Israel. Distant father David. Okay, I think his, his biological dad was actually King Asa. If you read through his story, um, if you read the story of King Jehoshaphat, um, he thought 
he had this great business opportunity, right? And they were going to make a boatload of money. And if you read through that whole story, you get down to, to chapter 20 at the very end of chapter 20. In verse 35, it says, after this, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, allied himself with Ahaziah, king of Israel, who acted very wickedly. And he allied himself with him to go make ships to go to Tarshish. So he thought he'd make a boatload. And they made ships in Ezion Geber. But Eleazar, the son of Dadava of Merishah, prophesied against Jehoshaphat, saying, Because you have allied yourself with Ahaziah, the Lord has destroyed your works. Then the ships were wrecked so that they were not able to go to Tarshish. So bad deal, right? And it, and it doesn't honor God. Paul goes on with his list in 2 Corinthians 6, 15. He says, what accord has Christ with Belial? That's a biblical term for Satan. Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. That, that's important for us to understand. Right? The temple of the living God is not this building that we occupy and keep sticking band-aids on or have to build on to it because it doesn't uh, meet the needs here. The temple of God is us. He, he, he goes on and he quotes the Old Testament here. He says, as God has said, I will dwell in them. And walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. And just the first verse of chapter 7 says, Therefore having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So if we want to have an impact for the kingdom of God, we are going to have to live lives of purity. Lives that honor God. Uh, we need to live for Jesus Christ. For some of you, and, and for some that aren't in attendance this morning, it's time to go all in. You know, you've, you've made a profession of faith. You've, you've called yourself a Christian. But it's time to be more than a Sunday morning Christian. So blessed, actually, this morning. You know, be, uh, being a minister has ups and downs. I, I met with someone this week that leaving the church for, for different reasons. I met with somebody this morning that says, hey, we've been called by the Lord to step up and do more around this place and to get involved. Met with somebody last week, same conversation. But hear the Lord on this. It is time for some of you to go all in. Let me warn you, if that's you or you think the Lord is, is saying that to you, because most of what you see on, on Christian television or you hear online or on... Uh, the radio or internet podcast or whatever you listen to, is that if you follow Jesus and if you go all in, um, wallet and bank account included, right, on most of those, then, then every day is going to be like working on a, a puppy farm with puppies and dolphins, you know, and all different kinds of crazy colors because you feed them Skittles and prime rib. I don't know. Puppies is like prime rib, I'm, I'm assuming. But that, that's not the Christianity that I read about in this book. It's certainly not the Christianity that we're living in in 2022. If you decide to step up and fully live for Jesus today in this country, it's going to cost you something. So you better choose. And my encouragement is, is be all in or be out. And I know that sounds harsh, but you guys remember what Jesus said about being wishy-washy, about being lukewarm? In Revelation chapter 3, 
verses 15 and 16. These are the words of Jesus Christ. He says, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. That's pretty descriptive of what the Lord thinks of that. So if you're going all in, the, the first cost of that should be giving up your sin. And, and for some of you, that means um, the cost will be giving up some pleasure. And for others, as we read through this, it'll be relationships, right? Some, some will have to break up those that aren't married, but connected to someone with whom they're unequally yoked. Um, some may have to get off the fence and get married. Stop playing house and, and make a covenant before the Lord and to each other that this relationship is going to stay together and we want to honor you with what we're doing. Some might have to get out of bad business relationships. And I'm not saying that you can or you shouldn't work for a non-Christian, um, but to partner with them is, is something very different. Others may have to confess some things to a, a trusted brother or sister or a husband and wife and, and start real accountable relationships. Because the world out there has absolutely no interest, none, in hearing about Jesus from you if he's not even real in your own life. Stakes are high. And I believe with my whole heart that the time is short. And for clarity, especially if you're listening online and, and you, you haven't regularly gone through the scriptures with us, salvation is not um, getting all emotionally worked up at a summer camp as a kid and you, and you go forward at the fire along with all the rest of your friends. Or it's not even saying a prayer in a church, in a big church or a small church, and then, and then getting baptized and continuing on in the life that we've always had. We're to be new creations in Christ. And Jesus saved us so that we would be completely different from what we were before Jesus. So Christians that are hearing me, we, not just me, are called to make disciples, right? And, and the mission field is outside of these doors. And the world is watching you before they will ever come and listen to me. I'll tell you something else. Historically, evangelistic Christianity in the United States was about sealing the deal, right? It's uh, to tell someone that they're a sinner to let them know that Jesus came and, and lived a sinless life. And remember that doctrine verse we, we said earlier? Uh, for he made him, Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So the message was, you're a sinner. Jesus can save you. Do you want to follow Jesus? And if so, then repeat this sinner's prayer and, and you can be saved. And when all that works out, perfectly and there's true repentance and belief that's still not making a disciple right? that's making a convert what we're called to do is to make disciples and that means doing all of those things sharing the gospel can somebody redirect him please to a different place in the nursing mother's room um doing all those things sharing the gospel sharing the truth but then taking them by the hand Right? And, and saying, come on, now I'm going to show you how to do it. I'm going to show you how to live this life, how to live like a Christian, how to grow in your faith, like Paul does here. And, and says, by the way, church in Corinth, here's how we did these things. And in closing, um, I want to clarify something from verse 17 that we read. Um, 
2 Corinthians 6, 17, he says, Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Don't forget that this has to be taken in context, right? What we talked about this week has to be taken in context with what we talked about last week. And, and it's in the totality of this letter. And remember, we are in the world. We're just not to be of it. Paul's not saying don't have any associations or, or don't have any friendships with those living in this world. Otherwise, we'd be terrible ambassadors, right? I, I, I spoke last week. I don't want to be part of a church that's just about building our community. And in his first letter to the Corinthians, Paul said this. In uh, chapter 5, verse 9, he says, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. But then check out what he says. Yet, I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world or with the covetous or the extortioners or idolaters. Since then, you'd need to be out of the world. But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother or sister, not to, not to be named a Christian who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. For what have I to do with judging those also who are outside? Do you not judge those who are inside? But those who are outside, God judges, therefore put away from yourselves the evil person. God seems to take a real issue here with pretenders. Those who say they're one thing but live a life that says something completely different. Christian, I want to encourage you to seek to live a holy life with faithful endurance. I want to encourage you to do that. Paul and his co-workers pleaded with others not to receive the gospel in vain. They were careful of their conduct so that they protected the reputation of the ministry that they'd been entrusted with. If we're ambassadors for Christ, our lives had better represent the king who's called us to serve him. Your commitment to purity will give authenticity to your words because our actions speak louder than words. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word. And Lord, I thank you that you brought us to a faithful place that teaches what you say and not our twist on it. Uh, we don't add to it, Lord. We don't take it away. Um, but Lord, I know even the words that have been read today can be offensive. And uh, Lord, I pray that there's no offense in my delivery, uh, certainly not my heart. But Lord, where, you, where your words have offended, I, I pray by your Holy Spirit that you would um, use that as a call to action. Lord, use that as a call of obedience. That things would change. And, and Lord, maybe most of this didn't apply to most of us, but maybe some of us have been called to go all in. Lord, and we've been, as, as Brett prayed this morning, Lord, just so amazing how your Holy Spirit works together. Uh, that we'd, we would take that step and we would trust you and obey you in that. So Lord, use your word, use us. Give us the, uh, the boldness to step up and do what you've called us to do here. Lord, bless those that are in children's ministry today. We're thankful for them. And please bring our ladies back soon. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.